Welcome into another episode of the Coach's Corner uh, with Phenom Hoop Report. Uh, before we get it, uh, started to introduce everybody, just wanted to let all the subscribers and viewers and listeners to uh, make sure you subscribe, leave some comments. You can check us out on YouTube as well as our podcast series. So we're, we're providing all outlets here. Uh, again, my name is Patrick O'Brien here. I'm with Rick Lewis, and we have a special guest, uh, Coach Ty Johnson from Cox Mill. Um, Coach, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Just doing well. Getting used to the new normal right yeah. now, but doing good. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad to hear. I know Rick has uh, has got his questions lined up for you, so I'm going to let him take over here and let him roll. Welcome, Coach. Um, thank you for coming on today. Um, we have a lot in common between Ty Johnson and myself. I know his dad really well, Tommy Johnson, who coached in Wilkes County, was at Wilkes Central for many, many years when um, they were playing against Statesville High School and my daughter Bridget. So I know um, Coach Johnson's dad really well, and um, he has a tremendous name in the area. Um, also, Coach Johnson graduated from North Idle, so did I, so we have another uh, common bond there. But, Coach, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today is you – done a remarkable job in just a short period of time and we want to go through this for our listeners and our viewers but you know you've only been in the coaching ranks for less than five years and you graduated from North Idaho. Um I think you told me after graduating you went to Bluefield College you was there for one year and then you graduated I mean you transferred to Warren Wilson College and you played there for three years and you graduated in 2015. So you played for your dad, and um, you've had basketball in your blood throughout your entire life. What was it like playing for your dad, and what lessons did you learn from someone who has such a great reputation as Tommy did? Playing for dad was honestly what made me want to coach and made me want to just serve people. Um, Playing for dad, like, you know, growing up, you know, his players over at the house, um, you know, we'd be just sitting in the living room and one of his guys would just walk in, walk straight through the front door, say, hey, how you doing? Go straight to the kitchen, make something to eat, and then come sit in the living room. Um, so playing for dad just really made me just crave wanting to improve young guys' lives. Right. Um, it, it, it made me want to serve them. Um, it made me want to just – it made me want to coach. Um Playing for dad was the most fun I've ever had with basketball until this year. Right. Um, you know, four of my college teammates and myself played together in college at Warren Wilson. Um, so, you know, we all transferred into Warren Wilson together. So, you know, it's just the bond that we had together just because of what dad, you know, brought us up on. So, right. I mean, play, playing for dad, you know, Obviously, you learn a lot of basketball and, like, how a practice should be ran, you know, how you should coach in games. You know, we could go over the X's and O's all day, but just playing for dad is more of, like, you see firsthand how much it – what it's what it's all about, you know, right. what it's supposed to be about. You know, it, everybody's going to lose a game no matter how long you do it or how good your team is. Everybody's going to lose a game. But what dad taught us – he loved us more after a loss than he did after a win. And I think that's the best thing about that. Wow. Now, Coach, uh, if I, remind me if I get this right here. For your first year out of high school, you, you got the uh, the girls' head coaching position at West Brunswick. Mm-hmm. Um, your team, The team only won nine games in the previous four years. You went 10 and 15 in the first season. How tough was that just being your first year coaching – um, just to kind of go in that atmosphere and in, in, in that area there, but uh, and what was the difference, kind of just coaching with on the girls' side of things? Man, I first off, when I went got to West Brunswick, the boys' coach there was Eric Davis, who used to be the coach at the Quail, who coached under Dwayne at North Mech, and you know under Coach Holden. Um, I learned more in that one year of coaching girls probably than I did in my first three years coaching. Just, you know, Eric took me – or Coach Davis – we're calling him Eric. Coach Davis took me under his wing, you know, taught me what the profession's about. Um, yeah. You know, I knew stuff from my dad and from growing up working camps. But, you know, Coach Davis really taught me, like, you know, 
how you prepare, how you carry yourself during the day, you know, how you're a teacher first and how you need to, you know, value that and your reputation always carries you and you only make a first impression once. Um, so I learned a lot that year. Um, just from him, you know, without the girls, the girls there, it made me a more, it made me a better teacher of the game. Um, fresh out of college, you know, everybody has what they want to do and what they think they want to do, but coaching the girls, it made me be a better teacher of the the fundamentals and, you know, you have to come in and, you know, you can't take shortcuts. You got to do it till it's right. You know, hold them to a standard that was high. Um, and they wanted it. They wanted to be held to a higher standard and get a team full of, I think we had six sophomores and five juniors. We had no seniors. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it was all, I mean, that was a really fun year. Um, grew a lot, made it, to the, made it to the playoffs for the first time in like six years there. And lost the buzzer um, up at Nash Central. So that was a fun, year. Um, really fun uh, year of growth, more of growth of like me just getting out of college, being 22 year old, 22 years old head coach and, you know, doing it, just learning how how it's supposed to be done, what you're supposed to do. Now, Coach, after you had your first year as a freshman coach at the high school level coaching girls, you then took a job back in your area where you originally grew up from, up in there, the Lenore area. You took a job at Caldwell Community College. You had a short stint there. You was very successful there. Then you returned back to West Brunswick to coach the boys team. And I think you said the first year you went 12 and 12. And the second year you were there, which is your fourth year of coaching, you went 14 and 12. What was the difference between coaching the boys and the girls in those first four years? Um, probably the, the difference is obviously um, the expectation was a lot higher. You know, coming in after Coach Davis, who I think he averaged 20 wins a year his last four years. Right. So, you know, the expectation's higher, the demand to, you know, hold yourself to the standard. You know, the biggest thing we do is, um, like, in our program here at Cox Mill, we set the, set the standard so high that the people that really want it rise to it. So, I think there the standard was high. And you're in a league where, you know, you got Brett Queen at Hoggard, you got Kurt Angel at New Hanover, Wells Gulledge at Ashley, you know, Coach Davis went to Laney, you know, Scott Wainwright, you know, his dad's Jerry Wainwright was at South Brunswick. So you got five guys in your league that, you know, you don't have, you don't have, you don't have a night off. Um, right. So I think going into that league, it made me a better coach in preparing, like, because you had to be. No matter what either coach had that night, I mean, you're coaching a league with five coaches that have over 300 wins and, you know, and probably some of the best in the state. Like, you know, Tuesday night, you get a Hoggard, who's one of the best offensive teams in the state. And, you know, I'm 25 years old, and you're going to play Brett Queen at Hoggard, and the game, the score is 31 to 33. And then you turn around in the maybe 40 possessions that game, and then you turn around on Friday and go play Coach, you know, Coach Davis at Laney or Kirk Angel at Hog or at New Hanover, and there's 80 some possessions. So, you know, just preparing your team. Um, I think more preparation-wise, it made me just such a better coach, and you had to be. It held me to a standard that you, know, you can't be un, you can't be unprepared, or you're just going to be embarrassed because they were such good coaches in that league. Right. Um, you was going up against a lot of experience, night in, night out. Now, after your fourth year of coaching out of, out of college, the job came open at Cox Mill. Mm -hmm. Joe Harvey had established pretty much a dynasty at the three A level. And he had taken that team to three straight state championships, winning two out of the three. And on that team, he had, of course, Wendell Moore, McDonald's All-American, who was going to do. You had Caleb Stone Carroll, who's going to UNCC. You had a host of other players. Basically, the entire starting lineup graduated. 98% of the scoring off this team had left. So – when this job came open, you know, what was your mindset saying, man, this is going to be a big, big challenge because I'm going into a situation where they lose everybody? Um, when, we took, when I took the job, first off, you know, my wife and I, I remember going up on, you know, taking my wife up after you know, we were offered the job. 
and we're on the you know the car ride back and we were just you know we just felt like that's where god was leading us to go and you know the thing was it's not what the job is or what's left it's how am i going to do my job right um and that that's the thing that you know that's the biggest thing taking is how am i going to do my job you know because our biggest thing is you know you want we develop in model citizens model students and model athletes um you know how do how high do we set the standard and we were we set the standard very high and that's what drove me there um was this just to to do something that nobody thought that you could um and i'm we're only as good as my staff and my staff is awesome Um, i had eric clark and jim kent who literally joined the staff and they were all in for the first time we met them and we just I mean, it it was it was fun just from the fact that you saw young people surrender them, surrender themselves for the guy beside them every day, um, which is uncommon nowadays. And there was just no self. I mean, we couldn't be fake. We knew we couldn't be fake because you know kids can kids and you know kids and dogs can sniff out you know bullcrap a mile away. So you know we knew. We we had to be genuine. We had to come to them real. We had to set a standard. We had to hold them to the standard, and they loved it. And they ch- they welcomed the challenge every single day. And, um, that's what that's what made the job great. You know, Coach Barbie said, you know, he had a great, he built a great program here. Um, so the standard was already high. So you know, when I got there, you know, we just met with you know Coach Clark and Coach it was just like, how do we raise it higher? And the ones that made the team, you know, rose to that standard. And you know, when we picked our team, we knew we, you know, we knew who we were going to take because they rose during the preseason. Well, coming into the season, no one really expected much out of Cox Mill because all the talk was they lost Wendell Moore, Kayla Stone, Carowell, the entire starting lineup. So no one had Cox Mill as far as you know competing for a conference championship. But in your first year at Cox Mill with a brand new starting lineup you went 25 and 4 you won the conference regular season and you won the conference tournament championship did you ever imagine that you would have that type of success early i did after we we went on our team retreat um after we picked our team um we went on a team we do it every year with my teams we go on a team retreat we uh took the team away for a weekend and you know, our biggest thing is, you know, serve the guy beside you. Um, we have a goal, bar- goal board um, that in our locker room, when you walk in every day, they write their goal for practice that day. And they have a season goal, and they write how they serve somebody that day. Um, and then just seeing what mentally, once we picked our team, where they were at every day, what their goals were. Right. Um, mentally, we knew where they were at. And then we go on this retreat, and um, – we saw what they put in their, you know, we have a Y box. If you come, if you come to one of our games, you see a box that has like a Cox Mill sticker on it. And that, that's why they play basketball. Um, we go on that retreat and they write why they want to, you know, why they play basketball. After we did that and after we got back from that retreat, we, we had that expectation um, because that's what the kids wanted. You know, the kids drive the bus. Um, you know, we, we, we set out the road and we tell them where we need to go, but they drove the bus. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, our job is to lead them and, you know, player led programs are better than coach led programs. So once we had that moment, um, together, we knew we were, we knew we were going to have something special. Um, and we knew it was going to be special. And, you know, the kids just, they rose to the standard and they kept setting it higher every day. And we preach, you know, be the model, be the model, set the standard, set the standard, set the standard. And they just kept rising and rising to it and setting the bar higher and higher every day. And they wanted it. They wanted to be coached. Um, they wanted to, you know, they wanted it. You know, they would, they wanted to prepare. They wanted to scout. They wanted to come in and work and they wanted to compete. So, you know, for us, it was, once we saw how they were after that team retreat, we knew that we had a chance. Um, and it wasn't nothing we did. It was all them. Coach, you said you had a motto for the team. It, it was um, PTP. What did that stand for? Um, program team player. Um, no one's bigger than the 
No, uh, no one's bigger than the program. No team's bigger than the program. No player's bigger than the team. Um, so that was just the motto we had, um, and they stuck to. It. No, nothing's at the end of the day. No, no players bigger than the team. No team's bigger than the program. You know, you know, Cox Mill basketball is a program. Um, as long as I'm here, you know, I won't let any. I won't let a team three or four years down the line to any less standard than I did this year's team. Um, no player is bigger than the team. Um, you know, if one guy has to miss practice for something, it's a consequence no matter what. Um, so, I mean, that, that's just something we we did as a unit, and they bought into it. I mean, it was it was it was fun. I mean, because it's just a standard we set, and they just rose to it. Um, and they knew that they knew what it meant to be a Cox Mill basketball player. We had a creed. Um, that you know, you talk to any one of our kids, they can recite it in seven lines. Um, and you know, I think I sent it to you. And it, I mean, it, you know, it's just it is what it is. And they just rose to it and they loved it and they just they accepted the challenge every day. Yeah, coach, I wanted to ask you about some of your players there. You were led by one of the, uh, a tremendous uh, guard, sophomore guard there, um, averaging four, uh, 15 points a game. But you also had a lot of other contributors as well. I wanted to ask you about their games, um, you know, what you saw and what you see in the upcoming season. But also I wanted to get your thought, which kind of follows into your question, your answer that you just had, is that you averaged 80 points a game and 20 assists as well. And it kind of falls into that PTP uh, area right there. But how do you get your guys to play so unselfish there? Just, I mean, just making them surrender for the guy beside them. Um, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not anything without my assistants. Um, an assistant I had back at West Brunswick always told me, you know, if you don't make him care about the guy beside him, then, you know, you're, we're not going to be successful. And we just carried that to here. Um, you know, they just surrendered, they surrendered themselves daily in practice, you know, in games, you know, if somebody was hot, they surrendered themselves. They made, you know, they, they made the extra pass. They made the, you know, they made a play because they knew that was going to help us win. Um, you know, Q was our leading scorer. He was also averaging five or six assists a game. So, you know, I mean, that was that was the best thing about this year's team is that they they didn't care how it got done. They just wanted it to get done um, because they had such a chip on their shoulder, um, and they wanted they wanted it for each other. Um, and I think that's the best thing is when you see a bunch of young people. I think that's – I mean, that's why I coach. That's why anybody coaches. You see a bunch of young people want something more than just themselves. They want it for, they want it for something more than themselves. And I think that is why, you know, they average 80 points. And we had so many assists is because they're just like, I want us to shine so much, so I'm willing to sacrifice or surrender myself tonight. Um, which the surrender thing goes in, you know, when we preach for that we need to surrender every day, it just goes into how we want to make a model citizens and model students, you know. Yeah. You know, you have to surrender yourself as an adult to your family or, you know, you have to sacrifice for your family. You have to do this for your family. You, do some, you got to do stuff you don't want to do. And you just got to embrace it and love it. Even when you're having a bad day, if you're having a bad day, what we tell our guys, while we have the serve board in the locker room, if you're having a bad day, go serve somebody. Go do something nice for somebody else. I guarantee you'll have a lot better day. Well, Coach, um, I was doing a series of books and basketball, and I sent out an email to different coaches about the academic success of their program. You sent me something back, and I saw the email, and you sent me a list of all the players on your team and the GPA. You have a cumulative average of your basketball team of a 3.5 GPA. You have 11 players, 11 players on your team that has a 3.5 GPA or higher. That's pretty impressive. How did you manage to get the balance of academics and athletics and get those guys to buy in to the culture that you established? Just setting the standard high. Um, I've said it a lot. I mean, we just set the standard and that's the standard and, went, and whoever rose to it, rose to it. Um, and, you know, the ones that rose to are the ones we kept, and the ones that we kept are the ones we kept, you know, holding to the fire every day. And, you know, they just wanted to be a part of what we're doing. Um, and we have great teachers at Cox Mill. We have a great a guidance office at Cox Mill that obviously 
you know, let me help hold our kids accountable. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's our kids. I mean, at the end of the day, like I can say something and do and hold them accountable, but the kids got to want to do it. The kids just bought into something bigger than what they are. And they wanted, we told them in the first parent meeting, we said we want to, our goal is a state title, and a state GPA title. We want both. Right. I don't, I don't think anybody in the state's ever done it. And we wanted both. And that was our goal. And that's our goal every year is we want a state title, and a state GPA title. You know, I think the state GPA title means more as a program, what we're about. And I think, I mean, we were that's close. Impressive. You said what? I said, that's very impressive. But that was one thing that really, when you sent that to me, I was going down through it and I, I wrote about the um, books and basketball about Cox Mill. And, and if anyone has a chance to look at it, look at the players that are on that list and the GPAs on the, on your roster, on your Cox Mill team is, is really unheard of. But, you know, what you've done, Coach, this is your fifth year. And what you did at Cox Mill this year, to me, is worthy of Coach of the Year. I'm talking about statewide. I know there's other people had a lot of success, but no one expected anything out of Cox Mill this year. And to finish 25-4 and four, just is impressive to me. Now, the other thing, too, is I follow you on social media. And um, I can tell that you're a man of faith. Um, tell me how your faith has been instrumental in you as a person and as a coach. Well, I mean, it's just being a servant. Um, you know, Jesus was a servant to his disciples. You know, and he led – I mean, and he led them. So, if he can do it, why don't – why wouldn't I do it? Um, I feel like you have to serve, and, you know, I think that's the, that's the number one thing I tell our kids is you got to be a servant. You know, that's why we have the serve board. You know, that's right. why I tell them, if you're having a bad day, you know, if you're having a bad day, go serve somebody. Like, even during this crazy time we're in, like, you know, if they're having a bad day, I'm like, hey, go do something for your mom or dad. You'll feel better. You know, and, you know, it's just – and, you know, I'm nothing with – you know, I'm nothing without – my faith and we serve, you know, we do what we do for other people and, you know, we're not, there's no way we can do it without, you know, somebody else. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's not on our own. And I think that's the biggest thing about me is just, and the, when I started coaching is I just made sure that I always stayed humble. You know, like I, like I said, like there's no award that we as a team get or I would get that's, mine you know right. as far as, you know if our team gets a championship our championship if i get a coach of the year it's my staff is going to get a coach of the year trophy as well like it's them like right. there's, no, there's no one coach there's no one player it's one program so whatever we get it's you know us together so i mean i think that's just just humble that just being humble and, you know not expecting anything and just doing for something more than yourself you have the we over me mentality. Um, this year you finished 25 and four. What's your expectations going into the next season? Because you pretty much have everybody returning. You know, it's funny. Somebody asked me that the other day. Um, we were on a Zoom call, and they were like, what do you think about next year? I was like, you know, at the end of the day, we have seven – yeah, no, seven juniors coming back. My job is for seven juniors not to go to college. Right. That's that's my goal. Um, regardless of wins, losses, how we do next season, my goal is, like, how do I get seven col seven rising seniors to not pay for college? Right. Not have student loans. Whether they want to play in college or not play in college. Like, how do I help grow them to where they don't pay for college? Like, I would judge my success as a coach whether how many, how much student loans they have or if they don't transfer. Like, my goal is, like, if a coach comes to me and they get a player out of our program, they're not going in the portal. They're not a normal kid. They're used to handling adversity. They love adversity. They take adversity head on. And that's the goal for a, a coach to get out of our program at Cox Mill. Like, you take a Cox Mill kid, they're not transferring. Right. Um, they're staying there for four years, and they're going to embrace every bit of adversity that they have at your program. So that's, you know, our – when people ask me, what's your goal for next year? Our goal was like, 
our goal is obviously to win basketball games, but my number one goal is to give to make sure they don't pay for college and make sure they go to college and make sure that they stay in college wherever they go. Um, that's my goal. If you told me I could win 25 games again or have all seven of my kids pay nothing for college, I'm going to take seven kids pay nothing for college. And I feel like if you say the other, you need to check why you're in coaching. Right. And I feel like that's why, you know, we're in it. We're in it to better our kids' lives and hold them to a standard and see them buy into something bigger than themselves that they get the reap the rewards from. Like, yeah, you, you sacrifice, you surrender yourself every day. And now when you get done, because high school basketball is a fraction of their life. It's four years out of, you know, hopefully 80. Right. So my goal is to make that four, make this time of their, this four years, the best four years of their life. So that's my goal. Make this yeah. the best four years of their life. So wins or losses. Yeah, that's good. But use this four years, use this four years to make you a better person, better student, better athlete. And to where you don't pay for college. That's, that's my goal. Yes. Now, Coach, looking at some of the GPAs on some of your roster players, uh, some of these young men are going to have an opportunity to go to college on academics. Because, um, I mean, I'm looking at Wesley Poindexter had a 4.7 GPA. Um, Bailey Gentile had a 4.5. Noah McCallaghan, 3.98. And um, John Anthony Baker at 3.7. The list goes on and on. But those are some tremendous um, student athletes. And at the end of the day, I've always had the philosophy of like, whether it's high school or college, use the, these four years that you have at the high school level or at the collegiate level for the next 40 years of, your, of their life. And it seems like to me, Coach, what you're doing is you're laying the foundation for each one of your players to be successful in the game of life, not just for the basketball team, but down the road. My last question I'm gonna have to you is, since this is your fifth year as being a coach and you've, enjoy tremendous success at such an early age. I mean, I think what you've done is remarkable. Um, what's the biggest challenge you have faced in your short five years of coaching? Probably the biggest challenge is, you know, just being, you know, I think the biggest challenge of being the head coach is just being the model every day, right. setting the standard every day. Even when you don't want to bring it, you bring it. Um, just because – like I can't come in acting like Eeyore every day to practice or a workout and expect them to, you know, play with their hair on fire or do do things to the or do things to the standard. So I think, you know, I think the biggest thing is just like coming in and, you know, like I'm the standard. Like we have I have set the tone. You know, it's not about me, it's about them. No matter what I go through during my day, which is what I preach to them. You know, whatever, you know, it's the same thing I say, like, no matter what happened during today whether it be a bad day at work or a bad day at home, I have to come in and give them everything I got and make this the best possible day for them. Just like I tell our kids, like whether you and your girlfriend got in a fight or, you know, something's going on at home, like I need you to leave it outside the four lines. Right. I think, I think that's the hardest thing about coaching is like, you know, you, you got to do the same thing you ask your kids to do. And I think you just coming in and leaving outside the four lines every single day, sacrifice and surrender and whatever's going on for your kids um and the other thing is just obviously balancing the home life like how can i you know obviously i'm supposed to serve our program and serve our kids but obviously you know my family comes first and how do we serve them so finding that time and finding that balance that's the hardest thing about coaching is how do i serve my wife and my two-year-old son on top of serving the kids that you know I'm responsible for so i think that's the hardest thing about coaching it's not you know games are fun practices are fun that's why you do it. It's the balance um, is the hardest part. Well, the one thing I got away from this more than anything, I learned something, you know, when things don't go our way, go, go serve somebody. That's a great valuable lesson, but we want to say thank you so much for coming on today. Um, we're excited about what you're going to be able to present to Cox Mill from a student athlete perspective, but also from a faith perspective, because you're a leader that, as you said, you like to serve, you're serving your team, and I think that's commendable. And um, we just need more people like yourself getting in the coaching profession and doing it for the right reason. Well, it's – and like I said, I mean, I, I appreciate what you guys do. I mean, I mean, you, the platform you give our kids, and obviously every time you say something about our kids, we say thank you from our social media, but it's like the platform you give our kids, like, you know, I mean, 
just like we're away from our families, you're away from your families when you're running an event or you're running, you know, whatever. So, I mean, you're away from your families. So, I mean, just like we're sacrificing, you're sacrificing as well. But, you know, it's not just me. It's my, I'm not, I'm, I'm nothing without my staff. I'm nothing right. without my AD. I'm nothing without my principal. Like, I mean, if I don't have the staff I have and the principal and the AD that I have, we're not, we're, we don't, we're not successful. Our kids, our kids can't be successful. Our guidance, our teachers, our custodians. So I think that, I mean, I appreciate it, but like, it's not just me. You know, it's a, it's a whole community. Um, parents, parents are the biggest part. If you have supportive parents, you can do a lot more things with, than other right. parents. So it comes from parents, custodians, principals, AD, assistant coaches. It takes a village. So, you know, we're, our village was good this year. And I, I feel like our village will continue to be good. Without question, Coach. Yeah, Coach. Uh, I just want to say that, that should wrap up our interview here with you. I just want to say thank you again. I know you definitely have made a mark on us, uh, Rick and myself and everybody at Phenom, but also with everybody around the state. Um, with uh, how you've been able to coach, but your leadership as well, both on and off the court there. Uh, so you're doing a fantastic job. And if, if people haven't heard your name, they will be hearing your name very shortly. Trust us on that there. Um, but I just want to thank you again. I let everybody know that they can continue to subscribe to our YouTube page, uh, our podcast series. And please leave some comments if you have anything of interest or anything out there. So we'd love to hear your feedback here. So from Rick Lewis, Myself, Patrick O'Brien, and everybody from Fina Hoop, have a great day, and we'll check back for our latest episode of the Coach's Corner. Uh-huh.